So my talk is titled Occupant Conscious Building Design, and it might strike you as strange that an engineer would be looking at such a soft thing, but the fact is I think it's extremely important and very overlooked. And this talk is really about the story of how I discovered that it is very important from when I was fairly naive about five years ago. Just to give some context to the issue, this is a picture of energy use in houses in Canada. And you can see that fully two thirds of energy goes to space heating, another sixth for is for water heating, and the rest is for appliances, lighting, and space cooling. This is actually good news because uh, heating is a very low grade form of energy. And also we know how to solve this problem fairly easily. We can add insulation to our buildings, we can improve air tightness, and we can improve our windows. So what really got me excited about this field and got me to switch from something completely different was when I discovered building performance simulation. And this is something that we can use to predict the performance of buildings long before they're built. So we can do things like test different design strategies. We can even look at technologies that have never been used before. And we can look at existing buildings and see what are the most cost effective retrofits. So essentially at the core of a model is a mathematical model representing a building with a geometry building envelope, uh, some elements of occupant behavior based on schedules. And uh, what we do is we expose that building to weather. Usually we expose it to a full year's worth of weather, although we can do this in just a minute or two by looking at what happened in the past. And we do this so that we can design buildings to behave optimally under all conditions, not just one day of the year, but to perform well under all conditions. Probably the most exciting thing to me is the level of outputs that we can get. So we can find out things about temperature in a wall or very obscure things, but also high level metrics like energy use, daylighting to the point where we can predict how bright the glare will be on someone's monitor or on their face. Uh, we could look at occupant comfort so we can predict whether someone will be comfortable or not, whether they'll be too warm, too cold. We can look at natural ventilation, renewable energy, all these sorts of things. And this is a big step forward from the way designs were designed in, sorry, buildings were designed in the past where we were using rules of thumb and usually it was expertise that led design. With building simulation, we can do a lot in a very little amount of time. But what's interesting to me is that while we've mastered the physics of building simulation, so we can predict the amount of energy that goes through a wall or how much solar energy passes through a window, we really don't understand occupant behavior. I'd like to show you a couple of case studies just to demonstrate my point. And so this is the Ecoterra house and it's a near net zero energy house, which means it offsets the bulk majority of its energy use with renewable energy. In this case, it's using a large solar system. And so this solar system not only collects electrical energy, but it also collects thermal energy. And that thermal energy goes down into the house where it's used to offset space heating and water heating. The house also has large south facing windows. These are not arbitrarily oriented, but they're strategically oriented so that they capture the winter sun and minimize solar gains in the summer. Finally, when the sun isn't shining and when the sun's not supplying the energy of the house, there's a ground source heat pump. The ground source heat pump extracts heat from the ground at such an efficient level that it only takes about one unit of electrical energy for every four units of thermal energy. On the inside of the house, there's a couple of features I'd like to point out. So first of all, it's very open concept and that means that all the solar gains that tend to occur in the south part of the house where the south facing windows are, gets mixed up very nicely and so that warm air goes up into the bedrooms and into the kitchen and that sort of thing. More importantly, the floor on the, right, on the left there uh, is thermally massive and so it has about an inch of stone tiles and below that it's about four inches of concrete. So instead of having the solar gains hit the floor, if it were a light, light weight floor, and immediately heat up the space and make it very uncomfortable, this floor is specifically designed so that the thermal energy is absorbed and only released over time. In fact, even when the sun sets, the sun will still be providing energy by means of this stored energy. So probably the most insightful day of my PhD when I studied this house extensively was not all the simulations that I was doing in front of a computer, but rather when I got to meet the occupants and understand how bad some of my predictions were relative to what was actually happening. <laughs> so first off, 
uh, I should say the occupants who finally bought the house uh, were a retired couple. And we probably assumed when we were doing simulations that it would be a regular nine to five hours, but these people were spending more time at home. They wanted brighter conditions, so they installed 24 uh, medium to low efficiency light bulbs. Also, very significantly, they covered the thermally massive floor with this carpeting. <laughs> and unfortunately, that rendered the floor under the carpeting less effective at absorbing the solar gains. Now, I can understand why they would do this. They probably felt that the floor was a little cold on their feet, and so they wanted to make things more comfortable. Finally, they converted the garage, which was inten originally intended just to store a single car, into a workshop. Well, to keep things warm, they installed this five kilowatt electric heater. The problem is this electric heater is only about a quarter as efficient as the heating system for the house. So this experience was actually very positive because it wasn't that they were intentionally trying to use more energy than the house was intended to use. It's just that they didn't know that these things were having a fairly significant impact. And so to bring things back into the big picture, if this is what your average Canadian house looks like, of a similar size to the Ecoterra house. Things look very different in the Ecoterra house. First of all, you can see it's quite small. In fact, if I were to add the solar energy contribution, that circle would be halved again. And, but what's more in, insightful to me is not so much uh, the fact that it shrunk, but the different proportions. So s before we were seeing space heating was taking up about two thirds of energy. Now it's only one third of energy. But what took its place is things like appliances and lighting. So we're seeing that people have more and more control over a building. In other words, the simulations that we were using before to try to predict energy performance are becoming much more difficult. So for a net zero energy house where simulationists are tasked with this apparently impossible task of predicting energy performance to within one or two percent accuracy, you can see that that's actually very difficult. So one way of looking at that is that we can't blame designers. The fact is it's the occupants. <laughs> but, but what I'd like to say is that designers actually do have quite a bit of control over performance. I did a follow-up study where I wanted a much larger sample size. That house only had a few people in it. And I wanted to look at a large office building. This office building has about 1,200 independently controlled shades, and I wanted to understand why people were controlling their shades. And I was hoping to see that they were opening and closing them depending on weather conditions and that they were doing this very regularly. Rather than take pictures annually, or sorry, hourly, and manually look at each picture and try to figure out where the shades were, I automated this process using a computer program, figures out exactly where the shades are. And I was hoping to come up with some correlations that showed how people move their shades depending on things like the solar geometry. Not overly surprisingly, but somewhat disappointingly, the shades remained virtually constant throughout the day. And I should say this day was sunny in the morning, cloudy in the afternoon, and people were not very responsive to the weather conditions. Now, it didn't take me more than about an hour to walk around my university campus and find cases where buildings were being used in ways that they certainly weren't intended to be used. And to me, this indicates that there might be a weakness in the design. For example, on the left, you can see that half the windows are covered in newspaper. And so all the benefits that windows provide us with, like daylighting and views, uh, clearly were not that important to the occupants when it came to comfort. In the middle, you can see that even in the dead of winter, this office occupant chose to open their window. And that suggests that someone else chose the temperature for that entire building, and the person in that office wanted to become comfortable, and they did whatever it took to become comfortable. And you can't really blame them for that. And then here, you could see, even with these large windows, the fact is that most of the shades remained completely closed. And so the question is, why would you make the windows that big in the first place? Windows tend to be big energy hogs. And so I think we need to design buildings a little bit differently. Rather than optimistically assuming that people, rather than optimistically assuming that people would go out of their way to save energy, we need to recognize the fact that people will probably take shortcuts. And so the result is that we need to design buildings such that the path of least resistance is also the path of least energy. And there's a few different human characteristics or traits that we can take advantage of uh, when we're designing buildings. 
For example, the perception of control, it turns out, is at least as important as control itself. So if people feel that they're in control, they tend to be more tolerant of slightly irregular temperatures, for example. People are also very adaptive. So if we give them control over clothing level, and anyone that's lived with me can attest to the fact that I take advantage of that. <laughs> and we give them, we let them move around in a building so that they can move from less comfortable conditions to more comfortable conditions. Or we let them vary their activity level a bit so that uh, if they're overheating, they can sit down and take a little break. Those are all good things. Transparency is also very important. So this notion that buildings should become more complex and have very complex controls that no one understands, I kind of disagree with. People want to understand systems, and if they do understand systems, they'll be more tolerant. Social considerations are also important. It's one thing, one thing to have individuals in single offices, but when you cram 10 or 20 people into a cubicle firm, then suddenly people have to be sensitive to everyone else, or maybe they won't be sensitive. And then there's also diffusion of responsibility. So you'll have situations where each person thinks that someone else should be responsible for turning off the lights at the end of the day. Finally, and this point is obvious, is that people tend to take action more when they're uncomfortable versus when they're comfortable. So back to my shades example, the reason why the shades were probably mostly closed is because there was some instant in the past week or month when glare was a problem, so they closed their shades and turned on the lights. But meanwhile, they probably didn't reopen them once the glare problem went away. Uh, so the way I think we should be designing buildings is to optimize things like fixed and passive design. So this means getting the geometry right, getting your window size positioned, your windows positioned and sized properly, having fixed shading that doesn't involve any people, um, and even having interior design such that desks are not placed where glare is likely to occur, and also having flexible design such that a building can evolve over its lifespan without uh, any big impacts. Next is good controls. Only once we've mastered the geometry of a building and the fixed design should we look at controls rather than using controls as a band-aid for poor design. And so a good example of good controls would be where you have lighting in an office where the controls only um, let the lights go on once someone has actively pushed a button and otherwise they remain off. And that would imply that you have a situation where the daylighting is adequate and someone decided they don't actually need to turn the light on at all. The last thing that we should use to improve predictability of energy savings in a building is occupant behavior. This is probably the least reliable. But the one example where I think we can have some impact is merely informing people of the impact of their energy decision or their, their behavior and ultimately energy use. But we shouldn't be doing this on a monthly basis and for a large group of people. Instead, we should be doing it for individuals and in real time. That's the only way that people will really make the connection between what they're doing and what the energy, energy impacts are. So the solutions tend to be really simple. So things like having con individual controls for each person, very important. That way people can make themselves comfortable without worrying about that of others. Having more modest sized windows such that people aren't having to MacGyver different solutions to, for example, put newspaper on their windows, which ultimately will probably never leave until someone else uh, <laughs> occupies the building. And having good fixed shading so that instead of requiring people to move shades actively, just having an overhang there that prevents any glare or excessive solar gains in the summer. This diagram on the right shows a newer solution, and it's just to have fixed louvers between panes in a window. And what this does is it reflects all the daylight that would normally hit uh, people and computer screens and the workspace. It reflects that light up onto the ceiling where it's re-reflected deep into the office, thereby providing lots of daylighting and no glare. So just to summarize all this, I'd like to put things in perspective. For every dollar spent on energy costs, for, this is rough numbers, there's about $10 spent on rent and $100 spent on salaries. So a true sustainable building doesn't just reduce energy, but it also provides a comfortable and safe environment for people. Thanks. <laughs>